This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by JetBrains, maker of intelligent development tools to simplify your challenging tasks and automate the routine ones. JetBrains is offering a 25% discount for an individual license on the C++ tool of your choice, C Lion, Resharp, or C++, or AppCode. Use the coupon code JetBrains for CPP Cast during checkout at JetBrains.com. Episode 123 of CPP Cast with guest Gina Stevens, recorded October 12th, 2017. In this episode, we have some fun with sorting algorithms. Then we talk to Gina Stevens from the St. Louis C++ Meetup. Gina talks to us about the C++ Foundation's presence at the Grace Hopper Conference. Welcome to episode 123 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? Doing good, Rob. I've had a busy week. <laughs> yeah, you've been doing some traveling, right? Yes. Um, well, to not go into terribly too much details, I guess those of you who follow me on Twitter saw that I just posted a video of watching a SpaceX launch from Florida. And, well, I just got uh, back home from that um, trip to Florida like 10 minutes ago to start recording <laughs> this episode. That's awesome. And those are those are the you know rockets that are going to land back in the middle of the ocean right? Yeah, the first stage booster, at least, I know they're working on the second stage also, can uh, it just lands itself right into a um, barge in the middle of the ocean. Not that I saw any of that. I just got to see the no, rocket go no. up from a few miles away. That's pretty cool, though. Yeah, yeah. Fun fact, I think my brother does work on the SpaceX program. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah he's a CAD designer out in California, and, and I think he was uh, contracted to do some... Um, some work design work on on that on that program. Well, that's pretty darn cool. Very cool. Okay, well, um, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this one we got an iTunes comment uh, from Ricky Ticky Tommy saying, <laughs> "CPV Cast is a pleasure to listen to. I've learned things that have directly applied to my job. Thanks, and keep up the great work." Uh, so yeah, that's always great feedback. I'm glad that the show is actually uh, useful instead of just being uh, fun to listen to. <laughs> That is nice to hear, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us today is Gina Stevens. Gina is a software engineer with over 20 years of experience, 13 of those leading development teams. Most of her experience has been with C++, in addition to Java, .NET, and various scripting languages. And the breadth of her development experience includes DOD, FDA, DOI, hospitality, and finance. Gina has a bachelor's in computer science from MSNT in Rolla, Missouri, and a master's in computer science from the University of Missouri, STL. She also founded and runs the STL C++ user group. Gina is also a Desert Storm Air Force vet, which during which she worked on the B-52 bombers that were carpet bombing Iraq. She is happily married with two sons, both of whom are serving in the U.S. Navy. Gina, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I've been a fan for a while, so this is really an honor to be part of the show. I appreciate <laughs> you, the opportunity. Thank you very much. Oh, it's great to have you on. You know, Gina, when, when Rob was reading your bio, I was just I was hoping that the three-letter agencies would just keep going. <laughs> I wanted to hear like 10 of them in a row. It's like a whole alphabet, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So obviously DOD is Department of Defense, DOI is that Department of Interior? That's right. That's correct. I worked for the U.S. Geological okay. Survey in, uh, in Rolla while I was going to school. Oh, that sounds awesome. cool. I am actually uh, curious about the work you did with the B-52s, though. I was an avionics uh, mechanic, so I worked on. I don't. Are you either one of you familiar with a B fifty two? You ever see a B fifty two before? I, you, I've never seen one up close, but I'm familiar with the, okay. the plane. Yeah, so I want to think I've seen the, one. 
inside the cockpit, there's upstairs where the, the, the pilot and the co-pilot sit. And then downstairs is where the radar nav and navigator sit. So I worked on about 80% of the equipment they, they touch. So all the navigation equipment and there's redundant navigation equipment, um, on a B-52. So there's like, you know, three different system, uh, navigation systems. And then also I worked on the, the infrared system and then the, the steerable t- TV that's, that's, uh, that's on the B-52 as well, as well as the radar. Wow. So were you like actually on the B-52 while it was going to Iraq or were you doing like maintenance afterwards? No, we, I worked in the shop. So we, uh, okay. I was actually stationed in Guam during Desert Storm. So I had a pretty, pretty good ex- <laughs> Desert Storm experience. Unlike, you know, some <laughs> friends of mine who were in the army and they were there in Dahran, for example. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I worked on, I was in, in the, in the shop working on components and I would do periodic phase inspections on the B-52 when it was in the hangar. So is that mostly That's like hands-on, awesome. like electronics kind of like, I mean, like you were repairing electronics and maintaining electronics directly or was right, it from like exactly. a software perspective? No, it's from a hardware perspective, uh, actually co- repairing the, the components that come off. So when I say components, I mean, if you can imagine, like a like a navigation system would be like an eighty pound component that we'd have to pull <laughs> off and run diagnostics on and 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 compare it and re- repair it. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. it was a great tour. I mean, I I right out of high school, and I would totally recommend it to anyone who was getting out of high school and weren't quite sure what they were going to do. Uh, I always knew I'd get, go back to computer science, but uh, I wanted a little bit of adventure first before I went back to school. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we have a couple news articles to discuss, Gina. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking to you more about the uh, conference you sure. attended recently. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is Facebook has apparently been working on C++ module support in GCC. And I hope this is pretty interesting, and it means that, if I'm not mistaken, we'll have uh, Clang, GCC, and MSVC module support uh, in a somewhat... Uh, near timeline? Sounds like it. Yeah, I mean, LVM's already there, and I believe MSVC is already there in, in the latest Visual Studio. It's just, uh, it's not a thing that I've been keeping up with, modules. This keeps happening, doesn't it? How often have we talked yeah. about modules? Someday I'm going to have to try to use them. <laughs> yeah, and just to give a preview of our, our, our next guest, uh, we'll be talking about someone who's a little skeptical about modules, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Gina, yeah, have you the... worked? Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say, we had a presentation at my C++ meetup. Uh, John Foltz uh, re- did a presentation on modules. Personally, it's not it's not the one thing that I'm excited about, C++20. I mean, I'm more excited about concepts than I am about modules. I mean, I'm sure they're useful if you need them, but... I've, I've never worked with a, a system that I actually, I, I saw a benefit of using, uh, of using them. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then this next article is someone wrote a branchless UTF-8 decoder. And this is a really long article. Um, and the code is actually done in C. So <laughs> I haven't read any C in a while. It was a little bit difficult to look at, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pretty interesting that he was able to to do this and, and be completely branchless. That was uh, pretty kind of a cool, neat that hobby was. project. Yeah, I looked. At yeah, the, I looked at the code just because I was curious, and I actually um, threw it into God the uh, Godbolt online compiler just to mm-hmm. see if there's oh, okay. truly any branching. Now there's a few jumps, but I don't know if if we if I guess he's assuming that I guess he means by branchless there that it's truly there's no explicit branching. I guess is what his point was. Right. So the, you're saying the compiler is generating jumps if you look at it from that perspective. Right. I only, to, and to your point, yeah, I only looked at the one, the output of the one compiler. It was GCC 7.2, I believe. Hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't spent um, very much time looking at this. It'd be very interesting to see what it's doing. Yeah. And the next one, uh, this isn't an article, but it's kind of a neat little tool I found, and it's called... Uh, Tone of sorting, it's an interactive oralization and visualization of sorting algorithms. So basically you can choose between all these different sorting algorithms, you know, bubble sort, quick sort, and uh, choose how many different uh, items you want to sort through. And it just creates this little, you know, kind of stepladder 
a, a little columns of a different height and it goes through the process of sorting them according to uh, the different algorithms behavior. And it's just kind of cool to see, you know, visually how these different algorithms work. And it's kind of fun to listen to. Yeah, this is where I need to make a confession now. So as I said, I like literally got off, got back to the house like 10 minutes ago. And sure. uh, well, I knew that I had about 10 minutes to look over the news items real quick. And uh, I got to this one and I couldn't get past it. I just sat here watching this thing, sorting different. It's fun. <laughs> and... It's pretty cool. Is that is that is that tune going to be stuck in your head next time you're doing a quick sort or a bubble sort or anything like that? Coming wow. along. <laughs> and I have to admit, you know, I'm I'm by far not I'm not the algorithms guy, and I've never heard sure. of cocktail sort or gnome sort. No. Yeah, that. One. Yeah, this has some weird ones. Never heard of gnome sort either, or or the cocktail sort, but. Uh... Yeah, these things are fun to watch. The cocktail sort's fun, though. It's like a bubble sort that ping-pongs. Yeah. So it's, it's, go ahead. All of our listeners need to click on this link and entertain themselves for the first hour of yeah. work Did, once they get it. Just yeah, pause was... the episode right now, go find the show notes, and, and watch this run through at least once. I highly recommend it. Yeah, I was like a cat with a laser pointer watching that thing. I'll tell you. <laughs> Okay, and last one, uh, we got another CVP contrib report, uh, this one being from the JetBrain C++ team. Uh, Anastasia Kazakova wrote this one up. And uh, interesting to see their perspective. Uh, she talked mostly about the keynotes and also uh, a little bit about some of the talks. Um, they talked about some of the recent guests we've had, actually, like Charles Bay talking about Stood Error and... Uh, yeah, and uh, Tony Vanier, Postmodern C++. I'm really looking forward to that one going online. Yeah, uh, I need to watch this second part of that, if you will, the CPPCon version, since I saw the C++ yeah. now on live. Yeah. And uh, they also highlighted the talks done by the JetBrains team, including two from Anastasia, two from Phil Nash, another one from Ivan Sorokin, who I guess is another uh, evangelist they have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of conferences, uh, Gina, you were recently at the Grace Hopper conference. Uh, for listeners who haven't heard of that one, could you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, absolutely. So the Grace Hopper conference is a celebration of women in technology. It was named after uh, Grace Hopper, who uh, was really a pioneer in the computer industry. Uh, not only was she the first female Navy admiral, but she was also uh, the person who most notably co coined the, fa the phrase bug, so as there's a bug in the software. But more interestingly is that she uh, conceptualized the idea of uh, programming languages. So you, you know, kind of wonder without her if we'd even have C++. So uh, a Admiral Hopper passed away in 92, and a few years later the Anita Borg Institute decided to to uh, produce the conference. And so the conference has been going on for about 20 years. Uh, as, that, as the name oh, wow. suggests, it, you know, it's a celebration of women technology to, you know, to really highlight the contributions of women to the, biz to the industry. But you know, it's definitely not just open to women. Men you know, are certainly welcome to attend. In fact, there was, uh, I'd say about 15% of the, of the attendees there were, about, were, were uh, men. Uh, and I also invite your your uh, listeners. You know, if they've never attended, attend it. The attend to attend the conference because it is really a great experience. And also, uh, one thing I would like to you know, challenge you you two or your listeners is that um, you know the C plus plus community has really a wealth of talent, and I think it would be really wonderful if we could share that talent with the Grace Hopper attendees. To my knowledge. I, I don't know of any, you know, anybody from the community who's actually done a presentation at at Grace Hopper. Doesn't mean they're they're it doesn't exist. They don't exist. Or it hasn't been done. But um, it would be nice if we could give a present to someone from the community can give a presentation about the community, uh, you know, some about C plus, you know, what's interesting about it. Because the majority of the of the people that attend the conference are in college, and in in, in my experience. Um, you know, they're not really introduced to C++ until later, until the more advanced uh, computer concepts, computer classes. Uh, and, and pretty much after that, after academia, they're not really 
you know, using it. It seems like the majority go on to, to Java or, you know, one of the .NET mm -hmm. languages. So, uh, you know, this is the best time, in my opinion, to really bring them into the community and really get them interested and excited about C++ is to, you know, get, basically get them when they're young, you know, and they're just starting their, their career. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my, uh, get off my soapbox. <laughs> Um, so what what sort of, uh, you know, conference talks do you have at the Grace Hopper conference um, since it's not like focused on any one programming language or uh, technology? It's kind of just, you know, women in tech is what you're saying. So, so what are the different talks like? Well, there would be there's different tracks. So there's the career track. Um, if you, for example, you want to uh, be on a board, you know, how would how would how would one get onto a, a board uh, for, you know, for a company or a nonprofit. There's also technical tracks. Uh, for example, we had some people from, Tom, you know, I worked for Thomson Reuters, and there was people there from Thomson Reuters to talk about big data and what we're doing with big data. So it was really a real, real there's a huge spectrum of, what, of the, 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 the um, information that's covered. So anything from software to, that's, that's related to software development to, um, you know, tools for testing to, you know, where the industry is going. So it's not focused on, you know, just w what, what are women doing in technology? It's, it's focused on technology. You know, the subtext is, you know, what are the, some of the contributions that women have made? So I don't want, I don't want it, people to think that it's focused on w women in technology. It, the, the focus is technology. So if you can imagine that breadth or that spectrum of information or that, that gets disseminated at, a con con at the conference is pretty vast. So uh, how big is this conference? So this year we had 18,000 people, and they were totally sold out. And every wow. year it gets bigger. So this year was 18,000. Last year I think they had between 15 and 16,000. So it conti it's continually growing. And women from all over the country uh, attend this conference. In fact, well, the first time I attended was three years ago. i, I got to share this story because it's hilarious. Uh, three years ago it was in Minneapolis, and... One of the things they do to really create, you know, community w during the conference is they have these, uh, they have these dances. So if you can picture this, they they played the wobble, and there was women in full burqa doing the wobble on the dance floor. It was the most, it was the most awesome thing I've seen in my life. If you if you know what the wobble is, it's hilarious. Look it up on YouTube if you don't. It's hilarious. But people in full full burqa doing the the wobble on the dance floor it was. It was uh, something I'll never forget, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, I mean, you know, I go to a conference of 600, 1,000 people, and I'm like, this is just overwhelmingly big. There's no way I can, you know, possibly even find all the people that I know here in the community. I can't even imagine a conference with like 18,000 people at it. Oh, yeah, and it was, it was very well, um, I mean, there was about 300 vendors there. Uh, not just uh, universities and nonprofits, but some notable uh, private organizations as well, like Facebook, Google, Oracle, um, uh, Disney was there. I mean, the list goes on hmm. and on. What were um, some of the keynotes like? Well, I, unfortunately, I didn't get to see the keynotes because my focus was you know, running the booth. You know, I felt this is the first time I've ever personally ran a booth at, at Grace Hopper. So um, I wanted to, to focus on that. So I didn't get to see the keynotes, but I can tell you that uh, one of the keynotes was uh, uh, Bill Gates's wife, Melinda Gates. Mm -hmm. uh, she okay. was there. She, she delivered one of the keynotes. So with you running the, the C++ booth, uh, what sort of presence was there uh, representing C++? So uh, the C++ Foundation went in as a platinum sponsor, and what that means is, is they get an uh, exhibitor's booth, uh, which was, was, was built out and set up in the ex exhibition area. This is where the area where you, know, you can really uh, interact with the attendees. And also they were, they were allowed to have an interview booth, which normally is used for, um, for those companies that um, are hiring or looking for, uh, you know, that are offering oppor uh, employment opportunities, that would be the spot where they can have some privacy and talk a little bit more privately to the potential candidates. So for our um, e exhibitors booth, so the, <laughs> this, is, this was the first time, like I said, this is the first time the foundation was a Grace Hopper. I really wanted a concept that, you know, was visually appealing, would draw people to the booth, you know, uh, had an element of fun, 
but also I wanted to convey time and progression of the C++ language. So uh, I, had some, I had some pretty good high-level requirements. So the concept that we came up with, my design team I think nailed it. We went with a uh, Pac-Man uh, 80s arcade theme. And so, you know, 80s arcade theme, if you think about the colors that are that's in the Pac-Man game, you got the bright yellow, the pastel, blues and pinks, etc. So visually, it was arresting, right? It was, drew, drew, drew people to the booth. And then the whole idea of a game is, you know, ad, adds an element of fun to it. But in order to convey time and, and progression of the C++ language, you know, one of the activities we had was an upright, working Pac-Man game, um, just like you would have seen in the 80s arcade, and also an Oculus Rift uh, experience. Oh, nice. So if you think about the original Pac-Man, it was written in C, which is kind of like the root of C++. And if you think about the Oculus Rift experiences, you know, the entire platform SDK is written in C++. So you can get a, you have a visual, you know, of where C++ started as well as where we are today. So you, you have a, a visual of the progression of the language as well as a sense of the longevity, how long we've been around, you know, from, from our root Pac-Man, which... Questionable, questionable graphics, you know, compared to today, compared to the Oculus Rift experiences that, you know, seamless uh, graphics and pretty cool, pretty cool experience. So I think that those two, th those two items really conveyed the, the, the time and the uh, evolution of the language. One of the activities that we had, hands down, the, was the absolute favorite, was just an old school trivia game. So what we had was a black table. It's actually kind of funny. Black table is decorated to look like a uh, Pac-Man game. And there were okay. these yellow cardboard discs, right, about three inches in diameter. And the game was you had to flip one over, and you had 90 seconds to read the question and answer as many questions as you could. And, you know, if you did well, you got a prize. So I'm going to see how well you guys would do. So I'm going to ask, ask you two a couple of questions. So one Should of the we questions, just, like, yell out answers or something? Or? <laughs> that's right. Just yell them out. Just, just yell them out. So one of the um, questions was... Um, what is the C++ feature that is equivalent to Java generics? Templates. Yes. Oh, he's, uh-oh, uh-oh. Rob won Jason zero so far. Ha. Not that I'm keeping score. <laughs> okay, the next question is, what is the name of the Java mascot? Oh, Java Duke. the mascot? Duke, I know, right? That's what a lot of people Yes! That's, oh, wow. Jason, you're literally the only person who got that. I mean, nobody really? at the conference got that. Yeah. I mean, I, we had some people that had been in software for a while. You're the only person to have gotten that answer. I okay, first more, used Java in the pre 1.0 days in 1996. <laughs> 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 okay, this next question um, I think one person at the whole conference uh, got it right, and it might be my wording, so I'm going to throw it at you too. Uh, what is the term for source code that looks like there's a design problem? Code smells? Yes! Congratulations! Okay. Okay. <laughs> nice one! Okay, wow! Good job! See, you guys would have done very well. You guys would have, you guys would have won a book. <laughs> if we had been operating as a team. <laughs> uh, so yeah, hands down, it was, the, it was the favorite. Definitely a favorite. In fact, um, one, some of the, the feedback that we received from some of the attendees was, uh, we made, this is an actual quote, we made C++ fun, and that's not easy to do. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, this, I think the uh, booth was a success. I was not sure what, what to expect going in, and, uh, you know, we got, we were busy. There was a constant flow of people. We had about 1,000 people through our booth. If you think about that, 1,000 people, and, you know, seven hours the first day, seven hours the second day, even if I round down and say it's only 900. So seven, seven, and then like the last day is only like four or five hours. So you're talking, what, 19 hours? You're still talking about 50 people an hour wow. coming through wow. the booth. I mean, it was constant. It was constant. It was just, it was so, yeah, I was really excited to see that kind of response. And people love the giveaway. So one of the giveaways that we gave was a drawstring backpack with a C++ logo and people loved it. I mean, they wanted, they wanted more set. They requested more things with the C++ logo. They absolutely loved it. Yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Well, I'm, I'm really curious about this. Uh, you said you had an interview space available since it was a platinum sponsor. Did you make use of that? Actually, yes, we did some customization because, you know, 
uh, you know, clearly there's no paid positions at the foundation, but I <laughs> right. wanted to utilize the space since it was part of the, the, pro, the you know, pro, part of the package. So we, I customized it to look like a, uh, basically a, you know, talk show set. And if you, there actually, there's a, if you go to YouTube, the CPP con channel on YouTube, there's, there's one, uh, interview that I was able to use. And uh, if you look at that, in the back is the, um, the map of the C++ users groups worldwide. So that was the backdrop. And then we had a couple of armchairs and a, and a coffee table. Unfortunately, uh, we were so busy with the ex- – ex- between being so busy with the exhibition booth and people constantly coming to the booth, and then there's not many people that were willing to sit down for an interview – it, it, I think, you know, we did two interviews and there was only one that we could actually use. And then as I was looking at the recording afterwards, the sound was like really horrible. And so, you know, I still wanted to have something up there just, you know, to show that what we were doing at the conference. So I, I went ahead and uploaded it anyway. But I mean, it's, you know, the, the sound is, isn't, isn't ideal. I did watch that one interview that you posted and I was very happy to see that the, uh, the woman you got to interview with was uh, from my alma mater, uh, the College of New Jersey. Oh, neat. Okay, yeah, yeah Victoria, she was great. I, and I unfortunately, I, I didn't get to her last name. And the other interview we did, um, uh, she, it was so, you know, at the start of the interview, the, the, the cameras just completely went out. So, um, uh-huh. and I tried to get her back to see if she would come back and do another interview, but I couldn't find, I mean, in 18,000 people, I can't, <laughs> I can't understand why I couldn't find her. <laughs> Well, Rob and I can definitely um, commiserate on the possibility of <laughs> recordings not always working out how you would like them to. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, did you get a good sense from like the, the attendees? Like, were, were a lot of them really interested in C++? Because I know we, we always worry that in, in you know, academia today that they do seem to be focusing on teaching you know, JavaScript and, and C Sharp and, and not really spending much time with C++. Absolutely. I mean, the people that want a, a, a C++ book, we had C, we had books donated from both Pearson and O'Reilly Publishing. Oh. And I tell you, they won a book and you, you, you would think that they won the lottery. They were so excited <laughs> to get a book. You know, it was, it was great. But what was interesting to me and I... Uh, please don't send me hate email uh, because this is what I'm, I'm not saying this, but there was a couple people that thought that the terms that were used, they thought C++ was obsolete or dead or uh-huh. um, what was, I'm trying to think of the other t- term they use. And there was a couple people, I mean, different people. And I was, I mean, it was only a handful, but still even one seemed too many. It's like, I don't know where this, this myth is coming from. Uh, but I assured them, no, it's not dead. No, it's not obsolete. It's a, it's a living language. And, you know, to their point, I guess, when you don't have a change to the standard in 12 years, um, I guess to, you know, I guess that's where that kind of misconception kind of originates. But now that we have, uh, the plan is to have an update every three years, I think, I think that's going to dispel those misconceptions. Yeah, I uh, hope so also gotten comments many times that are like, well, is C++ even used for anything anymore? Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, yeah, it was actually kind of funny I, uh, that to, to hear that feedback. It's like, yes, it's used. There's like millions of lines of code. I don't think there's going to be any, anything to replace it anytime soon. So definitely a living language. I'm curious then what kind of response you got after you told them, yes, it is living. Yes, the language is still growing and still being used. Well, I explained to them that I think, well, from my assumption that the misconception is coming from the fact that there wasn't a change in the standard, I told them, I said, well, we just, you know, 20, uh, we just released C++ 11 three years ago, C++ 14, uh, we just released that three, or six years ago, and then three years ago, C++ 14, and you know, C++ 17 just released, and C++ 20 is in the work. So I conveyed to them, yes, there's still work. Yes, there's a foundation, a, a, a standardizing body that's that's working behind the scenes to to keep to keep the the, the language moving and keep it growing and keep it evolving. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, as we mentioned in your bio, you also founded the C++ meetup in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, what motivated you to start the group? 
um, completely selfish reasons. You know, I'm one of those people that <laughs> that have a lot of irons in the fire. So, um, you know, I didn't have the time to uh, to do the you know do the what I considered necessary research. Like, what are the what's trending? What are the changes coming up in C plus plus, etc. And I was always amazed by the people that I worked with that just seemed to have so much knowledge and just about about so many different things. And I was like, well, what? How can I fill this hole, what I felt was a hole in my education, my, you know, my, my own education. So um, I, had, I had heard that there had been C++ meetups you know, in other parts of the country, but there wasn't one in, in Missouri. There wasn't one in St. Louis. So that made me sad. <laughs> so I decided it was time that there was one in St. Louis. Uh, so that was my motivation. Again, completely, completely selfish. I wanted to fulfill, you know, fill a gap that what I thought was my own education. And so we've been We've had this meeting going on for, or this group going on for about three years, and I tell you what I love about the meeting, the, our group, is that um, there's so many people with such a diverse perspectives, background, and experience that, I mean, it's just amazing the type of talks that we've had. And, and to me, nothing's off the table as far as what people want to present. You know, it could be another programming language, it could be just whatever you think, as long as it's technology related. Just, you know, I, I really want it to be a community involvement. I don't want one person up there every month and, you know, giving a presentation because what I, what I feel you lose is you lose, you lose the benefit of having so many diverse perspectives. So I try to get people, even people that, you know, the quiet ones that sit in the back, it's like, really, if you want to present, if it's 15 minutes, you know, just something, it's just, you know, something, something that sparks your interest. So we've had some really good conversations. In fact, um, we had uh, one of the members, uh, John Foltz, he presented on Rust just a few months ago. And uh, it's been, I mean, we've had some really great uh, presentations. Next month we're going to have uh, one on concepts, which is coming up in C++ 20. So some really good stuff, really good uh, material that we've covered. So how many uh, people do you end up getting regularly to your meetup? I think we have a solid 10, 10 that are regulars, um, okay. which, you know, when you look at uh, the, the meetups in the Bay Area in California, I mean, from my, my, I was told that there's like hundreds of people, but yeah. um, for Man. our area, you know, I think, I think 10 is a pretty good in, and we get uh, new people on occasion, um, but yeah, 10 solid people that, that are pretty regular. Yeah, I think that's, that's more than we have for regulars right now in Denver, so yeah. Uh, I looked at the schedule and it says you just gave a talk uh, yesterday about uh, Grace Hopper and about Merkle trees, which is a data structure I'm not familiar with. Um, yeah, actually, it's uh, it was my own rudimentary uh, uh, re research into it because one of the technologies I'm interested in is blockchain, and I and during my just you know, my my research on blockchain and how it works and etc., I kept seeing this this term. And so I did a little bit of research on it. And Merkle tree is, you know, it's named after Ralph Merkle. He patented the idea in 1979. And it's a hash tree. Uh, can be, you know, uh, with the, with the, during my presentation, I showed a binary hash tree, but it doesn't have to be binary. It can be any, um, it could be any number of children. But it's really used in, if you think about computer systems that transfer data. Uh, between, you know, uh, to other systems, it's a way of, you know, the data integrity becomes an issue. So it's really of, of, of validating, if you will, uh, the, the data f between systems. So if you think about peer-to-peer -peer networks like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum or um, distributed uh, source code repos like Git, you know, they different applications, but they have one thing in common. They need to be able to verify the data that they're receiving from a peer. So the idea is that um, you know, a peer can validate an entire Merkle tree just by the root. So you have the data, which is the thing that you want, that you care about, that you want to keep in the leaf nodes, and the non-leaf nodes are, um, are hashes of the children. So you can validate the entire tree just given by the root, or you can validate a branch of the tree given a non-leaf node. I'm imagining all kinds of uh, rigorous proofs have been done on these things to show that the, you're actually proving the thing you think you're proving when you're using them. Right, exactly. So it's a way of verifying that what you have is what you think you have. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. 
But what's nice, like I said, what's neat about our, our meetup is that, you know, like I said, there's a lot of diverse um, experiences. And during my meetup last night, uh, one of the, the members, John Foltz, he, uh, you know, he's, he's just one of the, the, the gurus on the team, uh, in the group. And uh, he actually has, you know, I, I, what I presented was what my, my, just my basic research. But turns out he uh, had more experience. He was using it at his work, and so he had a real-world experience. So it's like, okay, now it's your turn to present Merkle trees. And I <laughs> literally just hand it over him because you know, that's the type of thing that people need to see and, and, you know, to learn. And I know that's how I learned, by seeing a real-world experience. So it was, uh, it was great uh, that he was able to basically backfill my presentation. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it sounds like a great group. Yeah, they are. So uh, you made a proposal for a new access specifier a while back. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about that and the problem you're trying to solve? Right. So, um, so in my case, uh, so we have, you know, as everyone knows, we have public, protected, and private. And uh, I had gotten this idea for my work in Java. Java has something similar. I think it's uh, default access. Uh, and so what I wanted in C++ was uh, an access modifier that with any object within the same namespace would have access to my object. So in my case, my specific case, I was uh, using uh, dependency, dependency injection and pimple. And so if you think about that, you know, my setter had to be public. You know, it was going to be called outside of my, my, my class. So, um, you know, public was the only thing reasonable. Private, private obviously didn't make sense because it has to be called from out externally, and protected really didn't make sense because uh, you know I, I didn't want to have to uh, subclass, uh, you know, subclass the class in order to be able to call my protected method. So, and I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't need that type of coupling. It's the highest form of coupling, and it didn't make sense in my case. So what I thought was, well, if I could have something. That was, you know, an access that's specific to a namespace. Uh, then, you know, it's clear it, to my mind. It was clear that this isn't something that clients should be calling, right? If I call it public, if I, if I, if it's public access, then anyone can call it, and I don't want to convey to my client that they they should be calling that. I want it to convey that that um, you know it's handled for them within the, the namespace. Um, so that's what I was trying to, to figure out. Um, what you know, I, I felt the, the existing access modifiers just weren't wouldn't work in my case, and um, I thought that this a new ac a need for a new access modifier. Would you say the access specifier is called in Java that you would, the proposal would mimic? I think it's called default, where if you don't give it an access modifier, then by default everything within that package has access. Okay, I think there's something similar. In, I think in C sharp you have the internal yeah. access modifier, which might be That's similar. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it seems like it's a there's. I think there. I think just by the fact that you have something similar in Java and C sharp, there's obviously a need for it. I mean, in my case, I was using dependency injection and pimple. Um, but there could be other use cases for it. I just, right now, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I can just talk to my specific case. But the, what the interesting part was, you know, um, I didn't really write out the proposal. I just submitted it to the group. So that's, if you look uh, in the instructions on submitting a proposal, the recommendation is to submit it to the mailing group first. And so I did that, and I, I got some positive feedback, but I remember distinctly going back and forth with um, Nevin I, and his last name, Liber, is, is that his last name? Uh, Sounds Lieber, familiar. Yeah. His, I think, or yeah. Liber, yeah. So yes. I remember going back, back and forth with him, and, uh, and I was getting frustrated, not at him, but at myself, because I'm thinking, if I can't explain it in such a way that Nevin could understand it, then there's no way in hell I have a chance <laughs> of going in front of the whole entire committee and making my case. So I just kind of gave up in frustration. Um, I still think it's viable, though. I still think it's there's a use case for it. Yeah, I would agree that it seems like something that uh, would be worth having in the standard. It certainly, and so if it has I'm, precedence in other languages... Yeah, I mean that by itself suggests to me there's there's other use cases other than what I've what I've experienced. So um, if it, if the other C languages were thought it was important enough to add it, then I would think that C 
C++, it belongs in the C++ standard as well. It's interesting. So do you plan to continue working on this idea at all? Uh, I, I do. I just don't know how to... I guess I can't make a good enough argument for it. I, maybe if someone was willing to help me, <laughs> you know, how can I put it in in this in, in, in? How can I how can I make my argument in a standard? Except I don't know. Uh, I'm not very verbose when it comes to documentation, and so if I have to make the argument in the standard, and that's the only thing that's going to talk to me, how can I make it convincing? And that's that's still what I'm kind of struggling with. Well, let's make it a, a call to action to any listeners. And if you think uh, an internal access specifier makes sense and you have some experience with standard D's or writing a proposal, uh, maybe call out to Gina and, and see if you can help her out. That would be awesome. That would be great. So is there anything else uh, we missed about the Grace Hopper conference that you wanted to share with us? Uh, you know, the one thing is that if, um, again, I was serious when, you know, inviting your listeners or you two to, to, to truly consider giving a presentation at Grace Hopper. Like I said, there's a wealth of talent in the C++ community, and I think it would be, it would be, some, it would be a crime not to share that talent with uh, the Grace Hopper attendees. Well, so um, now I'm curious because there's 18,000 people, and you said there's many tracks but how many people would one expect to be presenting to if they presented at that conference? Um, it depends. It depends on, you know, uh, but I would, su I would say the one, when I attended the sessions, there was, anywhere, depending on the session, there was anywhere between 50 to a couple hundred people. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So not gigantic. I'm imagining like 3,000 people in each room or something at this rate. Well, I mean, because there's other tracks going on. So, right. you know. How many tracks were there in total? Do you remember? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't remember. Okay. Okay, well, Gina, it's been great having you on the show today. Um, where can listeners find you online? Um, I am on uh, Slack, but I, uh, my email address, you can use gina.stevens2017 at gmail.com. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show today. Yeah, thanks for joining All us. Right. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. It's website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.